Congratulations again to MUSC on receiving and being recognized for the Pinnacle Award. It is certainly well deserved. These past two years have been overwhelming for healthcare workers in every level, and demonstrating leadership has been and continues to be essential to getting through this time. My name is Dr. Matthew Cannon. I'm an SE Bio uh, member and also the Dean of the VCOM Carolinas campus in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Our mission at VCOM is to be globally minded, community focused to meet the needs of rural and medically underserved populations. We know our hospital systems are facing challenge, challenges with staffing of nurses, physicians, and staff in general. While we work on increasing the pipeline of physicians, hospital systems are being creative in finding solutions, and that involves innovation. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel who are focused on delivering the next delivering next generation care to our patients now. The provost of the University of South Carolina, Dr. Stephen Coulter, will moderate the panel, including Dr. Pat Colley, CEO of MUSC Health System, and Captain Valerie Jensen, FDA Associate Director of Dr Dr Drug Shortages. She is joining us virtually. Please welcome them. How's everybody today? Love the sound coming in. I'm not used to that sort of stuff. Usually when I walk in, it's the sandstorm is playing. Yeah, look at those socks. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> These are for Lou Kennedy. These are my Gamecock socks. <laughs> I'm Stephen Cutler. I serve as the interim executive vice president uh, in, uh, for academic affairs and provost of the University of South Carolina. Uh, I'll introduce myself in just a moment, but I would love to have our distinguished panel introduce themselves. I have with me a very good friend and colleague, Pat Conley, from the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, as well as Val Jensen from the FDA. Pat? Sure, thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm Pat Conley. I'm the CEO of the health system at MUSC. That's a role I've been in actually nine years now. My background, I'm a physician, internal medicine, and hospitalist. Uh, is what I've done in the past, uh, but most days I'm uh, working on other stuff. So. <laughs> Val? Yes, hello everyone. Dr. Coulter and Dr. Cowley, and uh, glad to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Um, I am the Associate Director for Drug Shortages at FDA. I've been with that position for a long time since we started the drug shortage program back in 1999. So it's, um, it's, it's, been an ongoing challenge. Shortages are, are a critical issue for the U.S. and, and globally, really. So um, it's something that we're very, very um, proud to do and, and, and glad to, to, to help with. And um, that being said, I, I began my career as a clinical pharmacist. So I um, was with Indian Health Service before coming to FDA. So I've been with FDA for 22 years now. So it's, it's, been, it's been a good road. So thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Val. As we all know, the theme of, of today's uh, event is, is about accepting challenges. And oftentimes when we see difficult situations arise, we have a choice, a choice to accept that challenge or to move along. We know that when we do accept those challenges, oftentimes they lead to a better way of life. And so we're gonna, we're gonna have discussions about the events that each three, uh, the three of us have experienced throughout our careers. So I'll give a slight introduction uh, to who it is that I am. Uh, I'm a medicinal chemist by training. Uh, that particular field is one in which uh, uh, is like an architect who designed this facility and built it, uh, designs and makes new medications. So my formal training is to take a biochemical process that might have gone awry in an individual and develop small molecules that will interact with that biochemical process, correct it, and then lead to better outcomes for that individual. So my particular background includes a blend of chemistry, biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, pathophysiology. Uh, I've been in academia for 31 years, started off teaching in a college of pharmacy. I've worked at four universities, two public, two private. Uh, I went to the dark side of administration about 15 years ago, chairing the Department of Medicinal Chemistry at the University of Mississippi worked on marijuana. We might get to that in this conversation. That's an exciting time in my career. 
Uh, and then I was recruited to come here to, the, to South Carolina to serve as the dean of the College of Pharmacy. Part of that recruitment included uh, Bill and Lou Kennedy. Uh, when I first met Bill, I was, uh, I was really excited about the opportunities and the ideas that he had. Uh, and then most recently with Bill Tate leaving to go be the president at LSU, uh, they asked me to serve in an interim role as the provost of the University of South Carolina. A lot of challenges in there that I accepted along the way, but I do want to highlight one. Uh, that uh, took place. So this was about February of 2020, uh, and a faculty within the College of Pharmacy came to me, uh, Dr. Philip Buchholz, and he was concerned about uh, what was going on in, in China. And China, as you know, during that particular time, uh, was experiencing the first leg of the COVID, now we know as a pandemic. And I said to him, well, how bad could this, vi could this virus be? Here we are two years later, uh, still sort of hoping that it's, we're on the tail end of it. What he came to me to talk about was the fact that he was having difficulty getting some of the supplies that he used in his research. Now, he's not a virologist. He doesn't work in that area. He actually works in the area of cancer. But the same supplies that he was using are the same supplies uh, that are used for nasal and nasopharyngeal swabs. That's the traditional way of detecting a respiratory tract infection. And he was concerned that should the virus uh, leave Europe and enter into the United States, we were going to have a challenge. It was going to be very difficult for us as a country to uh, mitigate uh, that particular virus. Based off what we were seeing uh, in the early stages of what Europe was experiencing in 2020. So I worked with him. Uh, I said I would help as much as I was able because I was still the dean of the College of Pharmacy, had responsibilities to the faculty, the staff, the students, the administration of the university, the state of South Carolina, the accreditor, and many other people that want to see a healthy and vibrant College of Pharmacy. He began working on this. He began sharing data with me. And as I was looking at the data, I realized this was a game changer. It had wonderful potential uh, in, in, in terms of its utility. The challenge was, is the medium he was using. It was saliva. It wasn't a nasal swab. And so the challenge that he accepted and that I in turn accepted with him was going to be how do we change healthcare? How do we change the traditional way of detecting the respiratory tract infection? And we navigated through this. My training is to translate stuff from, from, uh, from the laboratory into a clinical environment. Now, I told you it's about drugs. This is a diagnostic test, which was a little different. It's not the same thing as, 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 as my background, but it parallels it. There were many, many challenges along the way. First was convincing the health community that saliva could serve as a media for testing for COVID. The other is uh, securing a, a CLIA certification. That's promulgated from the federal government through Congress. It can come through, it comes through CMS, but it can go through either the FDA or the CDC. In our case, it's from the CDC. Uh, and the H Department of Health has the ability to award that type of certificate. We worked with many partners to get that certificate at our university. Uh, once we got that, we applied for an emergency use authorization with the FDA. Then the other challenge was, we're used to dealing with 96 well plates. We need to move to 384 well plate or even, and then we needed faster turnaround. Uh, and fortunately, we had a partner in Nephron. They donated to us a robot that accelerated our ability to test. We then were able to shorten the number of days from when a sample was presented to the results were delivered to three hours. Three hours. If you think back to 2020, you were hearing stories, and maybe some of you experienced this, where the results were taking five, seven, ten days. Heck, the virus is, is done with you. It's on to someone else by the time you got your results. So we were able to speed it up. It cost us $17 to run a test, as opposed to the $100, $125 that most were charging for that test. And then the efficacy of it was incredible. 99.9997% effective, or, or, or uh, accurate. We did two clinical trials. Those were a challenge within themselves. There are rules that you have to follow to do those clinical trials. We were one of only five universities in the country to develop this. The other four, Rutgers, Yale, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and UC Davis. We shared this with many universities, a couple in the state of South Carolina. It's not about competition. It's about beating down the virus. We also shared it with other universities in the Southeast Conference 
and they shared it with other people. And it spread around and is used widely throughout the United States. In fact, you see Thermo Fisher selling that particular technology today. It's an exciting time, and it was one in which many people rose to the challenge. In July, Lancet, which is the premier publication for uh, internal and general medicine, identified saliva-based testing as the gold standard for COVID testing. And now we're working toward changing how healthcare operates and how healthcare, uh, people in healthcare use saliva to detect a, uh, an upper respiratory tract infection. I could drill down in more details maybe during lunch, but uh, that's one challenge. If I have time, I'll share another one that relates to research in marijuana, a really good heartwarming story uh, that, that, that involves a, a young child and her ability to have a, a good quality of life. Pat, I know one of the areas that you're most interested in uh, involves diabetes, and, and as a type 2 diabetic, I really uh, love your story and love to hear from you. Well, you know, as, as you're talking, Steve, I'm reminded of, you know, brings back all kinds of stuff that happened over the last year, and what's interesting is that during a, during a pandemic, yeah. you know, everybody rises up. The harder challenge sometimes is when there's not a pandemic, when you just have, you know, normal stuff. And, and I think many of us, and I think many people in the room here today, you know, we, we, we get the, the juice from trying to move things, mm -hmm. move things quicker. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm always on to different things, um, you know, what we're trying to push forward or not. Um, I'm going to give you two examples. One of them is, and one of them is diabetes, but let me talk about telehealth for a second. Because telehealth is a good example of it rose up with the pandemic. But because we're not really changing what we're doing in the healthcare system, it's falling back as quickly as it rose up. So MUSC has been a telehealth uh, center, a national center for telehealth for about five or six years now. We got our start almost 10 years ago from the state of South Carolina, uh, giving us funding every year to figure out telehealth solutions for all South Carolinians. So we've developed a variety of telehealth solutions over the years. I think it's almost close to 80 uh, at this point. And we've used those things, and it's, it's a lot of, just like a lot of change management, getting people to understand telehealth and how to use it, when to use it, uh, just a lot of hard slogging uh, to get through. Pandemic comes through, you know, in, in March, you know, we're seeing patients like we normally do, and by April, we're not seeing patients at all in clinics, so we had to figure out a way. By May, we put the entire clinical enterprise up on telehealth. Everybody rose up. Every clinic, every doctor had an ability to deliver telehealth in, in some fashion, right? And something like 90% uh, of our clinical enterprise rose up and saw patients uh, for almost a year at a, at a very high level, 80, 90%. Uh, percent. But if you ask me what that percent is today, back around 15%, all right? At normal baseline, it sits about 10%. So it's falling back. Mm -hmm. So we've, we learned to use it. We saw what it was good for. And, and you can't tell me that a lot of people didn't like yeah. telehealth, but it's interesting how the whole mechanism falls back because we haven't solved all the issues with it. We haven't solved reimbursement issues with it. Mm -hmm. We haven't solved some of the technical issues. We haven't made it s even simpler for doctors and patients uh, 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 to connect. And you have a national designation as one of only two, I think, in the United yeah, States. Yeah, and, and we're good at it. And, and what, what we're known for at MUSC in terms of our telehealth center is implementation. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we're good at it, but it just goes to show you how yeah. these things fall back uh, quickly. Right? At the moment, Stephen mentioned diabetes. I'm really focused on diabetes these days. Right? I'm focused on diabetes, particularly with insulin uh, delivery systems and continuous glucose monitoring, right? There's probably not a technology or an intervention in healthcare that has greater disparity than this intervention. I mean, basically, for the most part, uh, you have to be able to get to an endocrinologist who will prescribe that for you, whether you have type one or type two uh, diabetes. Those that get to that endocrinologist you know, get on the technology, do very, very well with it. Right? But we're not making it easy and, um, as a industry to 
get that technology out much, much wider. And, and we, have, we have a little bit of a pandemic going on when it comes to diabetes. Almost 30% of Americans have either a pre-diabetes state or some uh, overt type of diabetes. So, you know, how do we take that technology, which is groundbreaking, fantastic technology, life-altering, right, and get it to the 30% that don't get it uh, uh, today? There's very, very few fractions of people with diabetes get it. So, so those are the kind of challenges that, you know, that I that that you know, have me thinking, how do we sustain things? How do we do things faster? Um, you know, how do we partner up better? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is, what, what got me into healthcare leadership a long time ago, um, had a mentor uh, open up a statistic for me in healthcare, which I didn't know at the time, but I went and looked at the data and I was shocked to see what he was right. But in healthcare, it typically takes 17 years from the initial thought to widespread application uh, within healthcare, right? There's, and yeah. that was absolutely yeah. true. I, I, when he told me that, I said, no, there's no way that's true, right? Until it dawned on me that, you know, when I was a young intern in 1990, a study was published in New England Journal of Medicine, front page of New England Journal of Medicine, about how to decrease central line infections. Uh, something today we call bundle compliance, right? But it wasn't until about uh, 2005, 2006 or seven until that became standard de facto way mm -hmm. of taking care of patients uh, when putting in a central line. So, you know, so th those are the things that are in my head. Yeah. You know, we rise up when, uh, when we need to and great things can come of it, but a lot of times we fall back as well. Yeah, so, so what, what Pat is referring to, that 17 years, that is the time frame in which someone like I come up with the idea and begin sort of creating what that molecule or, or diagnostic tool might look like and in, in, in then how long does that take to get to where a patient is now using it. You know, we have great technology as it relates to, to diabetes and the care of di diabetics. It's just translating that into practice and, 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 and the end user getting it, I think is where one of those bottlenecks exist. And that's what yeah, you're I think, talking about. I think with, with diabetes, with that particular technology mm -hmm. at the moment, it's amongst primary care doctors. Most primary care doctors, now there are exceptions, mm -hmm. that, but don't really fully embrace that technology. You know, part of it's the, 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 the technology has been very difficult, and, but it's become standardized. It's a lot easier to use, but it's, it's still not happening. So, you know, so how do we, how do we get more people mm -hmm into that technology. We're, we're working on that at MUSC. We're, we're actually working on educating our, uh, our primary care docs. We're, and, and for us, when, when you say we start doing it at MUSC, we're starting to do it throughout the entire state. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the stuff you, you, you struggle with all the time. Well, I'll say for myself, <laughs> I was diagnosed with, with type 2 diabetes when I arrived in South Carolina. Now, it's not because of South Carolina. <laughs> I, I attribute it to being in Mississippi, which is really the belt that, that Pat's talking about where we see increased di diabetes. Uh, and, and even I, with an understanding of diabetes and having educated so many students for so many years, I didn't understand what it was that I was going to be faced with in terms of managing myself. And so I think oftentimes, if, if you, well, let me say it, present it this way. My health care provider, wonderful, wonderful physician. He's very, very good uh, because he listens to me and he does everything with a prescription pad that I need him to do except let me sign it. But he's, he, he, he underestimated the counseling I needed before I entered into treating myself. And, and, and Pat, I think that's what you're getting to is that oftentimes we, we underestimate what that individual who's now going to receive treatment needs to understand. And then also some of that translates into the physician and their understanding of what they're getting ready to do. Until you've lived it and done it, it's hard to explain it. So we have Val with us. Val is uh, with the FDA, as she mentioned in her introduction. And uh, one of the things that we love to talk about with the FDA are, are some of the impacts that we see on, on new drugs, old drugs, repurposed drugs, vaccines, uh, and those, uh, those displacement issues that exist with that. Val, do you want to tell us how you accepted some challenges in your career? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, and it was really interesting hearing all the challenges that you both are facing um, and, and in healthcare in general, just all of the challenges um, throughout this pandemic have, have just um, been incredible. So um, at FDA, we're um, facing challenges as well. And, and as you know, our old, our, our problem really with drug shortages throughout the years since I've been involved with shortages since our program started in 1999 have really been um, it's it's been an old off patent drug problem drug shortage problem so it's been drugs that are really not profitable um, they're often made on you know the same lines as many other products and there's always going to be this juggle for what gets put, put first in the queue and and then some of those lines are aging. And so then there are the quality problems that come about and especially with sterile injectables where they're not easy drugs to make, um, very challenging and complex to make and to keep that product sterile throughout the process. And, and it's a long process. So it's, you know, it's a, at least a three week process to make a batch of a sterile, sterile injectable drug. So these have been our ongoing problems for years, dealing with those issues and working with companies on fixing their quality issues and, and getting new, um, players that new new market market um, players into into these markets and, and expediting review and and encouraging um, you know companies to come into these these old um, off patent markets. So that's really been our role for years. And and when the pandemic hit, um, of course we've had all new challenges. So now it's it's not just that market. It's 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 the entire pharmaceutical sector. We're dealing with across the board, um, all kinds of challenges which can impact really any drug. And so um, early on what we were worried about starting even in January, and I think you all mentioned this too, um, you know, thinking about was this going to hit the US um, and thinking about what would be the impact. And, and so some of those hardest hit countries um, initially, um, China, and of course, India, um, talking to our pharmaceutical contacts throughout our ch our supply chain, just seeing what their impact may be, what what um, you know, what challenges may they face across the board with all all of their um, components and raw materials and starting materials. So, anything that they thought might be an issue, you know, of course, we offered to to work with them and and help them if they needed to qualify another supplier or um, anything that really they needed to address. So those were really our first issues, and and we worked through those that set of issues, and then of course it became an increased demand issue um, in the U.S., which we, was really unprecedented for some of these older, especially some of the older drugs that for hospitalized patients and some repur repurposed products as well um, that were being used to treat patients with COVID in the hospital setting. So dealing with that increased demand and and working with companies on that was kind of our next full set of challenges. And um, then the next, now really what we're still dealing with is, is displacement issues. So not only um, drugs that are being made in the same facilities as vaccines and, and diluents for vaccines, as well as the, the new um, very promising COVID therapeutics that are being used, um, some under EUA and um, those. So all of that has really um, created more of a capacity problem than we had before. So um, folks are all, all different companies are competing for kind of the same capacity at some of these manufacturers, as well as competing for components. So things that we wouldn't have even thought of as a problem. So for example, filters that are used in the manufacturing process, and as well as, as things like glass and stoppers and um, vial caps and those types of things that even labels that, um, you know, have become a constraint. So in that case, you know, we're, we're learning to be, well, we, I hope we've learned to be very, very flexible. So our, I think our lesson learned with, with this whole pandemic is, is being more flexible and, and really communication early on with any of these issues. So when a company finds out about um, you know, potential constraint or a potential issue communicating with us early on and, and um, you know, working towards solutions together. And, and that's been successful. Um, I don't want to scare everyone with all, all of what I've said because I, I think we really have been successful. We've had um, a huge impact, I think, on being able to prevent shortages. So this last year, we actually, through working with the companies on these displacement issues, these um, especially the, the competition issues where they maybe needed to, to use a, a different supplier, needed to even temporarily use a, um, you know, a new supplier while they, they fixed issue or their, their regular supplier was able to ramp up for them. Um, those types of issues have really been successful. So we've been able to, we were able to prevent 303 shortages 
last year alone, which is um, unprecedented. That's way, way more than we did the previous year. I think was 179. So we've we've tracked that every year, and it's it, it was um, a good year for prevented shortages. New shortages, we continue to have problems. We had. Um, and, and some of the same problems that we've always dealt with, the quality issues, the, um, you know, some of the manufacturing issues, but, but this whole, um, you know, the pandemic challenges have added to that. So we had 38 new shortages in, in um, 2021. And, and that's um, not, it's, it's not an increase. It's, it's actually a decrease from 2020, but it's still, it was, it was very impactful. And some of the things that um, we're dealing with are IV fluids, which obviously anyone, in the hospital that goes into the hospital gets a, a bag of IV fluid. So it's that's that's very impactful. We we absolutely are doing everything we can to to solve that problem, as well as um, some of the diluents. So that's that's a challenge too because those are needed for the vaccines and and um, some of the other COVID therapeutics. So um, it's adding just a, a drain or a, a, an ad additional strain on that market. So we're, we're working with companies on the IV fluid and, and diluent issues. So. Um, I'll stop there, but I really do feel, believe that we've had just tremendous um, co cooperation and collaboration with industry and other stakeholders. And I, I think that's what's really led to our success. Yeah, you, you know, mentioned, oh, go I was ahead. gonna say, you know, Val mentions an issue which what we struggle with in the health system because you know, over the last 20 years, we've gone toward more control of our formulary. So, you know, we don't, we don't have 20 benzodiazepines on the formulary anymore. Okay we'll have two or three, right? And, and it's gotten that way because from a quality standpoint, we wanna have fewer and, and people understand how to use and track and, and, and dose those medications. But, but let me tell you, when a, when a drug shortage hits and, it, and there's no notice, I mean, you, you might get a couple weeks notice and that couple weeks is only because uh, there's supply out there in warehouses, but it's, it's a major problem. I mean, all of a sudden there's no Ativan and, or the Razepam, and you gotta switch 1,200 doctors onto a new benzodiazepine, which they're not familiar with. So we're trying to look at this problem. How, how do we make these switches? If these aren't gonna go away, yeah. you know, because they really haven't. They haven't gone away in my career. They've actually gotten worse over time. But so, you know, but I'd love to understand, is there a way to, you know, for us to know, because what we've found, it takes six months to switch the medical staff to a new, say, benzodiazepine, because you got to train them, you got to put new protocols uh, mm -hmm. in place. Is there is there a way to know these things are coming, or is there just no notice that just happens? Yeah, that's a um, <laughs> an ongoing challenge. I think um, when when companies are aware that they're going to have a supply disruption or manufacturing interruption, um, they're required to let FDA know. And, and the requirement is really that they're supposed to let us know six, six months in advance or, of course, if that's not um, possible because it was a sudden line shutdown or you know, something more immediate happened um, as soon as practicable. So, you know, reasonably they let us know within a few days. And if, if, you know, obviously our first step then would be to evaluate that market. Who else makes that? Bedazlam um, or Lurie's Pam. Can they ramp up? What inventory do they have? What production um, capacity do they have to meet that? that gap and you know what's the duration how long are we going to have have to deal with this switch um, do we need to look for other suppliers even possibly overseas which we've done many times um, if it's going to be a long-term issue and we can't um, you know our US approved manufacturers aren't able to meet the gap and then also of course expediting anything that that any of the companies need to increase that capacity and increase production. So if they needed another line or another raw material supplier, we, we would expedite that. But all of that's being done. I, I totally hear your point that getting that information to the healthcare professional, to the, to the hospital is, is crucial. So as soon as we know this is going to be a shortage based on that evaluation, and, and we do that evaluation very quickly within, within a day, um, are we, you know, we need to get that information posted as soon as it's a shortage. So we'll put it on our website as soon as we confirm this is a shortage and it's, it's going to impact um, healthcare. Um, trying to get that, that um, information as quickly as possible to where it needs to go is, is definitely a goal. Um, we realize that sometimes you are hit, you know, sometimes it is a sudden issue. Sometimes it's a line shutdown or a, a, even a facility shutdown, unfortunately. 
um, where we just have this immediate impact. Um, and that, that's tough. I'd love to dovetail off this. So when, when, when we talk about benzodiazepines, there's a, there, there are a couple dozen in, in that therapeutic class, but they, they don't all have the same effect. They have the, the major bucket of effects are anxiolytic, so that's like Valium. You have a skeletal muscle relaxant properties, and then you have some that have, will cause a little bit of amnesia. Those are great for people that are going into surgery. Versed is a great example. So, so it's not like you just say, okay, we're, we're out of this benzodiazepine, let's, let's start, uh, put this one on our formulary. It has to match that pharmacokinetic property and the pharmacological effects that, that you, and I know you know this very well, and this in all therapeutic classes, but the benzodiazepines are one that are just a very fascinating group of compounds. And so even, even if you see one fall out, finding a, a, a suitable replacement is not as easy yeah. as it sounds when you say there are two dozen in the class. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not easy, and mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to teach um, providers how to dose it differently. Exactly. Understand it. But there's an opportunity there. So, yeah. uh, a challenge. If somebody in the, <laughs> yes, exactly. If somebody, you know, this, this is something that's not going away, and, and I do think that if, if you can help health systems switch, um, I, I think there's a tremendous challenge or opportunity there. One of the things we noticed uh, that, that Val also pointed out were uh, competition for certain things, filters and uh, uh, the cell culture plates. Uh, also, uh, gloves. And one of the things that just really warms my heart is that Nephron is getting into that business because they saw early the challenges associated with getting gloves. Face coverings. If you remember early in, in, in the pandemic, we were told, and I won't identify the federal officials because that's irrelevant, we were told that face coverings don't work, then we're told that they do work, and part of that was really to ensure that we had enough materials in the hospital settings. Uh, of course, now we know that, that they were effective until Omicron showed up, I guess, <laughs> is when that all changed. But these challenges exist, and there's wonderful opportunities for us to, to, to embrace those and make what we do better for other people. I'd like to share another story if I can just for a moment. This is going to be some of the marijuana stories I promised to share with you. Anybody from the F uh, DA in the audience? Just uh, curious. <laughs> so so I, got, I, got some, I got a lot of great stories, but this one's going to, this one's going to tug at your heartstrings. So we, were, uh, we had the only federal facility in the country that legally could grow marijuana. We had a schedule, actually a couple of Schedule One licenses, one to do the research uh, one to manufacture it, which is a fancy way of saying you, you can grow it. Um, and, then, and then we would share that with other federally funded individuals. Uh, so, so the story is about CBD, and it's the same CBD that you see being sold around in, in stores around uh, South Carolina. But at the time, CBD was still a Schedule One product. C CBD is non-psychotropic non-psychotropic, but it's Schedule One. The reason is it comes from the plant. And so the DEA sees an opportunity for diversion to, to occur if you're growing a plant that's producing CBD. Well, this company was, that, that wanted to develop CBD as a therapeutic agent wasn't even in the United States. They're from the UK. They came to us uh, and asked us to help them set up clinical trials. It's GW Pharma, uh, who, who we all know now, but but 10 years ago, you say GW Pharma, and most people would, would look at you all glazed over. They were basing this off a story of a girl. Her name was Charlotte Feige. She was a twin, uh, and, and her twin sibling was epileptic free. But Charlotte experienced about three to 400 seizures a day. Three to 400 seizures a day. That was her life. And so the mother heard uh, uh, anecdotal stories about CBD being effective in certain types of epilepsy, pharmaco-resistant forms of epilepsy, Dravot syndrome being one, and was able to get some CBD, had a chemist clean it up, gave it to Charlotte, and that day, the first day, she only had two seizures, and they were at nighttime. By the end of the week, she was out riding a bicycle with her neighborhood friends. Just a heartwarming story. As we're watching the clinical trials with GW Pharma, we were seeing the effectiveness at 47%. 47, Pat, you know the FDA is not gonna pass that. So, 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 sorry, Val. <laughs> but the FDA wants to see in the high 90% effectiveness. 
So FDA initially was going to decline uh, that uh, product moving to a uh, therapeutic agent. Well, the parents of those children who benefited accepted that challenge to go to the FDA and secure uh, the approval from the FDA for Epidiolex to be a prescription product. The problem with Schedule 1 is there's no therapeutic utilities. Those parents accepted that challenge too and went to the DEA. And I'm not sure who got it worse, the FDA or the DEA. Uh, but uh, before it was over with, uh, CBD, Epidiolex is the brand name, or trade name, went from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 5. And we see it being sold throughout the whole United States, including here in Charleston. And if you've you got a child that suffers from epilepsy and your child fits into that 47% uh, in which they're, they're, they can be treated, that's an incredible story. Challenge accepted by the parents to ensure that a product was delivered and made available when normally we, because of the parameters we have in place, and it's for safety reasons, uh, wouldn't normally exist. But just a heartwarming story. Let me go back to you for a second, just talk about how we're trying to rise up. I told you the telehealth problem earlier. And, and this may, maybe some folks in the audience may be interested in this, but one of the things we found with telehealth is we gotta get tele, we gotta bring telehealth to the community mm -hmm. quicker, better, faster, uh, get people to understand it. And one of the things we're, we've done, uh, we decided uh, in the last year to actually maybe begin launching telehealth companies for-profit companies that deliver on a specific aspect of uh, telehealth. The first company that we started at MUSC is called Virtual, Virtue Ally, virtually. But it, it's, it's basically a telesitter company. So they deploy, uh, they deploy sitters through a telehealth network, right, to people in hospitals, people in nursing homes, uh, and even potentially people, individuals at home, although the individual market uh, is, not, is not known yet. Um, and, and, and where does that come from? That, that came from what we've been doing at MUSC for the last five years. We've been using telesitters inside of MUSC to monitor patients. Now, now why is that a big deal, right? It's a big deal because in the old days when we had to put, put a nurse or a nursing assistant with a patient, it was one-on-one. -on -one. So we'd hire a nurse or a nursing assistant uh, to go sit in that room with the patient. Right? Now what we do is we bring in a camera. Right? We can watch the patient. We have means to connect to the um, nurse very quickly or whoever's watching uh, that patient. And one sitter can now watch, depending on the situation, six to eight patients at once. So you're talking one-sixth the cost, one-eighth the cost of, of something before, right? But, it, and it's only moving fast because we've taken it outside our normal situation at MUSC and, you know, we can't, we, we, we can't even service enough uh, other hospitals and, and nursing facilities uh, at this point. So, so, th so that's something, partnering up with, with others is we think the best way to bring more of these challenges out faster and solve them, solve them quicker. So I, I would encourage everybody, um, you know, in the audience to you know look to your look to your local universities and health systems which are are working on things. We're, we're you know USC is no different than MUSC and, uh, and 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 all the health systems across the state. But you know look for those things where you can partner with them, help them get that technology out. Right? And, and I'm, I'm already seeing this happen quickly, and I'd love to see, I'd love to see 20 more of these things uh, develop. And the reach, you talk about the reduced cost with telehealth and telemedicine, the reach. You've got individuals who normally would drive 20, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, that, that they just have to fire up an iPad or a laptop, and, and they're, they're speaking to a nurse or a physician. Yes, I, I think we're so programmed to think that everything needs to be face to face needs to be personal, but there's a lot of healthcare that doesn't, doesn't need to be that way. In fact, actually the most successful part of telehealth anywhere is telepsychiatry or telemental health. Mm -hmm. People actually are more likely to not miss their, are less likely to miss their appointments 
if they're doing a telehealth version of it. Yeah. So, and, and think about something as private and as, uh, as sensitive as what's covered in those, right. those kind of uh, visits. It, it, it's very done very, very well from a telehealth uh, perspective. In fact, that's the only area that we look back in the pandemic that's staying up at 90%. And, and, and uh, mental health has really skyrocketed in the United States, not just here in South Carolina, with COVID. I mean, it was already on an upward trajectory, but it really accelerated under COVID Ab the conditions. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Val, do you got any new medications coming along for us? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there are. I, you know, I, in drug shortage, uh, that the um, psychiatry area has thankfully not been impacted by mm -hmm. recent shortages. I guess that's an area that's kind of escaped them, um, which is, is good. Um, obviously, we, we keep an eye, though. Obviously, it's, it's very, very important. We, we had a sertraline shortage early on in the pandemic, and that really did affect patients. That was, it was terrible to have patients that weren't able to get their prescriptions filled. Um, we were glad to see that get resolved. One of the things that, uh, that we saw an unprecedented need for early on in the pandemic and throughout most of the pandemic was one of the divisions at the Food and Drug Administration, the office that manages emergency use authorizations. Can you speak to what that was and what the challenges were that that, that particular group had and how they, how they rose to that challenge or challenge is because there were many? Definitely. That that really has been, and, and I'm not in that office, so I, I can't speak in detail, but I work with um, the group and, and we keep close track of, of drugs that um, do get um, authorized under EUA and, and continue to follow um, the supplies of those and any challenges that are occurring with that. And then, of course, once they get approved, like remdesivir, um, we're working closely then you know, to make sure that those supplies stay available um, for treatment in, in, um, of COVID. And I am, I'll mention too, I'm not in the vaccine area. So that's a whole nother group within um, a, the, the CBER, <laughs> Center for Biologics group that manages vaccines and, and vaccine supply. And we collaborate very closely with them as well. Um, one more group I'll just mention too, and, and you, had, you had mentioned this as well, um, supplies of gloves and PPE and um, right now shortages of even tubing and, and empty bags and empty syringes, um, needles, all of that's being impacted. And, and our Center for Devices has a drug shortage um, program, a device shortage program as well. So we're collaborating very closely with them as well because that we're impa impacting them. Our diluent shortage um, and our IV bag shortages, shortages impacting the empty bags and the empty syringe um, supplies. So um, keeping close tabs on what they're doing to address those issues and, and what we're doing is really important too. But going back to the EUAs, I think um, that has been a whole new challenge for FDA. I think um, very successful and you know, it's, it's, it's worked. Yeah, I, I would say they rose to the challenge. It was incredible watching what I would call a small division of, of the FDA uh, receiving so many requests to evaluate so many products, uh, it, unprecedented in the history of the FDA and in, in the history of that particular group. Uh, I, I know that because uh, of some of the stuff that we did and, and we were hearing stories about how this previously underworked group was now working around the clock seven days a week and, and trying to accommodate all those requests that were being made. You mentioned remdesivir just a moment ago. Uh, this is a product that, we, uh, that was one of the early ones that were approved to, to treat COVID. Uh, I had a young uh, faculty member from the College of Pharmacy come to me complaining that South Carolina wasn't on the list to receive remdesivir early on. And, and, and I gave her a challenge without calling it a challenge. I said, you know, we ask our students to be advocates and, and, and here's an opportunity for you to be an advocate. Uh, she eventually landed on a special committee to the secretary of DHHS for the distribution of that drug and just a good heartwarming story and an example of what today's conversation is about, except in the challenge. And she did influence the ability for South Carolina to receive some of those initial shipments of that product. Yeah. Maybe I'll mention maybe one last, since we're, in, we're talking about COVID and I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a good story, um, but one that continues to be a, a, maybe a flashpoint. And that's, 
that's vaccinations, mm -hmm. right? And USC very, very early on uh, required uh, compliance with the vaccine mm -hmm. policy. We we're actually the second health system in the entire United States that decided to do that. We did that in April of, um, of 21. Uh, the first uh, uh, health system was Houston Methodist, uh, who was about two weeks ahead of us. But, but we talked back and forth and they just pulled the trigger uh, more quickly. And I wanna speak to this because I do think it is, you know, if you look at the history of vaccinations, um, required vaccinations, particularly required vaccinations into schools has probably been one of the most successful interventions that has been done in the history of, uh, of public health because it really raised the percent. Um, and this is similar. Now, we, we have required at MUSC for almost eight or nine years that every, uh, every person in our healthcare system needs to get a uh, annual flu vaccine. And we require that for a couple of reasons. We require that for the safety of our patients. You know, we don't want anybody spreading flu to our patients, number two. But the bigger reason we do it is to make sure our workforce can come to work, mm -hmm. right? And that has worked very well for us with annual influenza uh, uh, vaccines. COVID to me is no different, no different. It's a respiratory illness that's not quite in sync with, with flu. Um, it's probably just a matter of time before it gets in sync. But I th and, and most healthcare systems in the United States require influenza vaccines today, uh, annual, right? So this discussion about the requirement of uh, compliance with the policy for COVID vaccines uh, is a little bit of a, an anomaly. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we did that, we did that early. Thank God we did it early. There's probably no way we could have pulled it off uh, later just given the, the, the pushback uh, that we got, R really not from inside MUSC, outside mm -hmm. MUSC uh, and others involved. But, but because we did that, when Delta came last summer, we were one of a, only a handful of healthcare systems in, the in South Carolina that didn't have to turn off our elective surgery, right? Now, I don't even like the term elective surgery because you know if you're 75 and you're having a hip replaced because you're having severe pain, is that elective or not? Mm. Sure, you might be able to delay it for a few months, but we didn't have to do that, right? And we also saw only one fourth of our workforce off compared to other healthcare systems around South mm. Carolina. So, you know, I, I, I laid that out as a challenge. It's a, something we're still dealing with uh, today. In fact, before I come in, what have, it's top of mind because I'm dealing with it from a, from a public perception outside of MUSC issue, whereas inside uh, we, we do very well. And that doesn't mean everybody got vaccinated. Everybody did not get vaccinated. But I got 92% vaccinated. 8% uh, got a religious or a medical declination. Um, and, but that 92% helped us weather the storm and hopefully uh, we'll keep that up. Um, we're gonna maintain it. And, and, and MUSC was also one of the early ones that were participating, I believe it was the Moderna clinical trials, if, if I've got that right, is that? The AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. We were in early, yeah, but in the summer of yeah. 20, we were in early AstraZeneca yeah. um, trial. That was fantastic. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the end here. Uh, we've had a great discussion. I hope that you all have enjoyed it as well. Um, as, you want, as you know, we here at SC Bio and the panelists are interested in developing a, a, a better state of South Carolina and a better workforce. And we just wanted to share some of the challenges that each of us have had uh, in, during our career, but most recently uh, under, under the situation that we see with the pandemic. And I hope that you derived a lot from this particular conversation. I wanna thank you for when you have accepted the challenge and have improved the quality of lives of other people. Thank you very much. And we'll have Trent Holland who represents at SC Bio uh, board member to us. He's gonna have a few comments before we head to lunch. Thank you very much.